I'm here today to talk about the 3D model. Um, but before I do that, there is a, a quote that I wanted to share. And, and if anyone has ever seen talks on 3D models, there's a good chance that you've seen a quote. I can see Mark nodding at me in the background. And I never thought that I'd use this quote before, but I kind of thought, you know, this is appropriate. So but basically, this is uh, someone called George Box, who was a statistician. And what he said was that all models are wrong, but some are useful. Now, he's obviously right, because there's no way that we can perfectly represent um, reality using a 3D model. But he says that some models are useful. So what I wanted to do was talk a little bit about why we think that our model is useful. Now, if you look at the 3D model report, you'll see that there's a whole big long list of aims in there. And the vast majority of those aims are centered around things like understanding crustal architecture. And that's true, like the model, certainly the critical point of building this model was to try to resolve the crustal architecture. We wanna, we've been talking about these belts all morning or all day. We wanted to be able to try to resolve the geometry of these belts in 3D. So that was a critical um, aim, and we think that that's a useful thing. But all more than that, we wanted to be able to try to understand the geological history. So we were hoping that the model would be used to try to communicate what that geological history is. And I'm going to show a few examples of that. And of course, importantly, we think that model, um, we hope that the model will be used as a structural toolkit for mineral exploration. So we did use build the model in an explicit fashion. And uh, I did talk a little bit about, I know that some people in the audience were at the science in the surveys meeting um, last year. I don't want to labor this too much. But the basic difference between building an explicit or an implicit model is if we're building an explicit model, we're doing it manually. So we're taking all of the necessary data that we can get our hands on and we manually build the surface or whatever it is to represent the fault or the geological structure or whatever it's going to be. But the implicit case, we're basically saying, OK, we're going to take all of the necessary data sets that we can find, be it um, structural mapping, gravity, magnetic data, seismic, whatever the software will accept. We input all that data into the software package. Um, and then the software does a series of statistical analyses to generate a whole range of different models, and we can quantify the uncertainty associated with those models. Now, the reason why we built this model um, explicitly is because part of, like I said, part of what we wanted to do was explain the geological history. So we had some ideas about the tectonics. We had some ideas about how we think that these belts have been rotated, and you've seen a lot of that today. So to be able to incorporate that in, we needed to build some of those ideas into the model to be able to communicate that. It's also a regional scale model, um, and I find that incorporating, sorry, you, trying to build regional scale models using an implicit regime doesn't necessarily lend itself to that type of workflow. And part of the reason for that is things like inconsistent data densities, for example. Um, mapping data is not consistent. We only have mapping data where we have rocks exposed. Um, drilling data is obviously not consistent as well. And the last thing is multi-terrains. I mean, if we're modelling on a regional scale, often we're looking at a few different geological terrains, and that makes it difficult also. So there are a few different primary data sets that we used. And really, the most important data sets that we used to build this model would be structural mapping, the seismic data, um, drilling, and of course, magnetic potential fields, gravity data, that sort of thing. Um, but obviously, if we're building a model, we want to try to build as many different data sets as we can into that, into, that, um, into that 3D model. So some of those things that we're using are interpretations of those data sets, things like qualitative lines. And you've seen these qualitative data sets in Phil's, um, in Phil's presentation. The blue ones are the Cambrian faults. Um, and so these are all faults, and the, the red ones are all of the, um, the Devonian faults. But, and that's great, but that gives us an indication of what we see in map view, but it's not very good for giving us an understanding of what we see in, uh, in depth. So for that, we need to try to learn about that. So the first thing that we did was try to build a series of different geological cross sections. And what we're looking at here is the final, like is the end product really. So there was an iterative process that we went through to be able to draw these cross sections. And you've heard Ross talk a little bit about how we went through this process about things not working and having to go back and revisit. And one of those, an example of one of those things was we built a series of potential field models. This is Phil's work that you've also seen in his talk. So we created a series of different, he created a series of different potential field models and you can see the um, forward, um, so the calculated and the, <clears throat> and the observed response there. But this was a process where essentially Phil would say, yeah, 
this isn't working, we have to change the geometry of this thing. So we would go back and refine those cross sections. So once we end up with that, we want to create a series of curves, I'm calling constraining curves, to build a 3D model. And it looks like a mess when we look at it like that. But if we look at it in section view, we can see that essentially what all we're doing is drawing the line work on each one of those different sections to try and build the 3D model, or use those curves to be able to build the 3D model. So if we're going to build a surface, the first thing we need to do is isolate the curves associated with one of those particular structures. In this case, we're looking at the Escondida fault. Um, we're going to turn the rest of that stuff off, and then we can build a surface to represent that Escondida fold, which is what we're looking at here. And that's great, and that works, but that's the easy part. The hard part comes really when we're trying to create some other surface that interacts with that Escondida fold. So what we're looking at is it's another fault which branches off that. And you can see there's a white border around that. So if we look in the foot wall view from uh, that Escondida fault, you can see that that branching surface um, what I'm trying to point out here is that the surface is actually touching, it's touching the Escondida fault, and that means that it's watertight, it means that we can actually build a volumetric model, or a block model, or a voxet, whatever it is that you tend to call these things, 3D grid. So while I'm talking about methodology, there was one other thing, concept that I wanted to try to explain. And that involved this iterative process, I suppose, another iterative process, and Ross has touched on this a little bit as well. It's that when you build these qualitative, sorry, when you do these qualitative interpretations, just because all of your overprinting relationships all work and it's completely ge geological, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to work out that way when you build your 3D model. So sometimes you go, you look at it and you think, okay, well, this is dipping in this direction, um, but that has implications on some other structure that exists somewhere else, and all of a sudden it's not geologically possible to build that, 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 um, that model. So that's what I mean when I say we're testing it in 3D. So we have some particular structural interpretation, we test that in 3D, we go, is it possible, yes or no? And if it is, great, we incorporate it into our 3D model. But if it's not, then we have to go back and revisit that structural interpretation. And this happened a couple of times, we had to go back and revisit it. And that is definitely a downside to explicit modelling because you, you kind of need to start again, almost. But the good thing about this is that it's a proof of concept. So what we're saying is that the, the the, 3D, the, the fault network that we've built um, shows that it, it is actually possible to build that in 3D. So I want to talk about a little bit about the model components, what, the, what went into the model and what we actually have, have created here. Um, so what we really, the first thing we wanted to capture is the obvious things is those Cambrian structures. Most of them, are, we've said, are dipping towards the west. We also wanted to capture those Devonian structures that were responsible for reorienting um, all of those Cambrian volcanic belts. But when we look at the model, and most of you will have seen it by now, we look at a model like this and you go, that really doesn't help me understand those particular things. All I'm seeing is a mess of surfaces, and it's not necessarily helping me understand what the geometry of those Cambrian volcanic belts are. Um, so what we can do, one way we can try to solve that, is to only visualise the Cambrian surfaces, for example. So if we look at these, each one of these different um, surfaces, the yellow ones intended to represent one specific belt, which has been faulted a number of times, and if now we're calling them, we've got lots of names for them that you've heard throughout the day. But because these are thrust repeats, we tend to have an east and a west version of each one of these different um, faults. So we've got the Bunawa west fault and the Bunawa east fault, for example. So it still looks a little bit of a mess and it's still a little bit difficult to visualise. So what we did was we built a volumetric model and that's what we're looking at here. This is a, essentially a Voxet model. Um, again, we can see these different belts through here. This is the Grampians group. And the cool thing about this is it means we can really explore it in a, in a different way. So for example, we can turn off, these are all of these different um, components to the model, each one of these um, regions you can see here are a different um, thing that we can turn on and off. So I can turn off um, the Grampians group, for example, and we can see what the model looks like underneath the Grampians group. So in doing that, we've got the surfaces for the Bunawa belt and all of its different um, associated belts, and then we've got the, the volumes 
specifically for that Bunawa belt and all of its specific volume components. And the same thing for the Bunigal and the Stavely belt as well. So the next thing I wanted to mention was the Devonian faults. We know that these structures have been in place during the Cambrian and a lot of these faults are west dipping. Um, but then we have the Devonian structures that completely chopped this thing up and created this mess like the um, vodka warehouse that Ross showed. So this is most of those Devonian faults that we can see here. As you can see, most of these are dipping towards the east for the most part. And that's largely because they're all linking into this major um, Moiston fault, which is the master structure for this. Um, but again, it's, it's quite difficult to understand exactly what's happened with um, all of these Devonian faults because there's still quite a few of them there. Um, we can visualise just a few of them. These, we think, are responsible for most of that dextral movement during the Devonian, the Henty fault, the Mosquito Creek in the, the um, red colour there, the orange is the Escondida, and the Galton Fault in that purpley colour. So I'm going to turn, come back a little bit later to the Escondida and the Galton Fault. I think I've got slides for a lot of these things, but I've actually just talked about most of them. So the next thing I wanted to mention, I wanted to talk a little bit about, I singled out the Marathon Fault um, in particular. And the reason why I did that Marathon Fault is another Devonian fault. And uh, the reason why I've separated it out is because it's, we've interpreted it to be the base of the Grampians group. Um, so it is a fault in some places, in other places it's, a, it's an unconformity. But for simplicity, we've called it a fault everywhere in the 3D model report. Um, and I think that, that concept has been explained in there a little bit as well. But because the Grampians group is a lot deeper than a lot of the covered units, we did include um, a volumetric model, or at least it was included in that Voxet model um, as well. And there are some places you can see that it hasn't quite made it through, made it to, the cells haven't actually made it to um, describe that whole surface. And that just is, is, a, is a factor of the resolution of the model. Each one of the cubes in this, um, in this block model is 500 metres. So this would tend to suggest that the, um, the Grampians group is relatively thin at these localities. We also modelled the granites. Um, we did spend some time, um, Phil spent some time modelling the, uh, the shape of these in profile, but they weren't really um, seen as being the target. Really what we wanted to do was try to understand those volcanic, um, Cambrian volcanic belts. So we've, we're quite confident about the, um, the qualitative distribution of these, what the shape of these are, because um, these have been interpreted qualitatively using a whole range of different filters that Phil showed in his talk. But we haven't, we haven't modelled the, the shape of some of them, but not all. An important part to these models, obviously, is the cover. So these are included in the model um, specifically as um, a set of surfaces, but they're not included in that block model. And like I said, the reason for that is largely just because um, of that resolution. So for example, a lot of the cover is um, tens, hundreds of metres, um, whereas each block in that volumetric model is 500 metres. So it's not going to really, it's not possible to include it in. But there are a few different surfaces. This is the, um, the red one is the Murray Basin. Um, so this gives you an indication of the depth um, of the Murray Basin, the Rocklands volcanics. The blue surface here is the newer volcanics. Um, and then the purple underneath is the, uh, is the basement to the Murray Basin. I also want to point out, so the, the other project that GSV has is a thing called the Victorian Gas Program. And they're currently building a 3D model for the, um, the Oway Basin as well. So, if you're interested in this particular area and you want to know more about the, the top of basement for the Otway Basin, then please come and talk to us because there will be a refined surface for that. So the last thing I wanted to talk about a little bit was, uh, was tectonics. And I said from the outset that part of what we wanted to do was to, we were hoping that this model would be used at least to, um, to help with understanding for uh, tectonics for geological history. How did these belts actually end up being you know, redistributed during the Devonian, for example? And the example I want to use here is the Stavely belt. You can see this is the Stavely belt here, which is dipping towards the west. And then the narrow Pummelet belt is this belt here, which is dipping in a listric fashion towards the northeast. And these have been, like I said, these are the Devonian faults. The orange one is the Escondida, and the, the purple color is the Galton fault. And these, as you can see, the narrow pummelet belt, which is this one here, has been 
um, the narrow pump belt is compartmentalised between the Escondida fault and the Galton fault in this case. So when Ross shows his model, and he shows this restoration, if you keep an eye on the narrow pummelet belt here, you can see that it's been rotated around by about 130, 140 degrees or so, and then shunted to the south in a dextral way of another 30 or 40 kilometres. So how do we know that that's happened? Well, there's a few different observations that are worth mentioning here. And one is that we know that we think that the narrow pummelet belt is relatively steeply dipping close to the surface. And the reason why we think that is largely because of some of, you saw a lot of dip modelling that Phil had done. And these are just a couple of those dip models, but you can see that those are showing that it's relatively steeply dipping there. So we think it's relatively steeply dipping close to where it's, ex well, sub-exposed, if you want to use that term, where it's actually close to the surface. But the other constraint we have on the geometry of this um, is from the seismic. So the seismic is in the interpretation that we have shows that the narrow pummelet belt um, is this blue, um, this blue stuff through here. So if we're going to connect the, um, the narrow pummelet belt where we think it's uh, close to the surface to that, the only interpretation is really that it has a, this Lystric geometry. And that works rather nicely because when you restore this belt, so this end up, up um, back up to the, the northern end of the Staveley belt, it also has that um, Lystric geometry as well compared to the Staveley belt. And this interpretation is also supported by younging directions that we see in there, um, and, and potentially um, paleomag also. And it's funny, I said to Ross, so how did you know that, what was the, the key observation? There's all these different observations. What was the key observation that you came to when you, uh, when you decided that the, there was potential for the narrow pummelet belt to have been rotated through 134 degrees and then shunted 30 kilometres to the south? And Ross said, I don't know, it came to me in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, it sounds more like a nightmare to me. But. <laughs> anyway, I did want to mention briefly about model portability. Um, this doesn't seem to be as much of a problem these days as it used to be. Uh, we seem to be getting much better at it, especially with um, things like points, curves and surfaces. Uh, the model was built in GoCAD, so it's easy, obviously, we're going to distribute that GoCAD project. We also have released the model in a series of different, what I'm calling the native format for GoCAD. Um, VS is a, an export for curves, oh, sorry, for points, for example, PLs are curves, TS is the surfaces, and VOs are voxets. The reason why I'm talking about this is that these are all text files, so that means that they're easy for other people to actually see what the data is. Um, they can be imported to other things. And there, these days, there are a lot of software programs that are accepting these GoCAD objects, um, like Profile Analyst, for example. The other thing is DXFs. We've exported the whole model, um, with the exception of the block model, as DXFs, points, curves, surfaces come through as DXFs. Um, the hard one was that block model. And uh, like I said, it does come um, programs that can read um, GoCAD objects will import that block model without any problems. Um, it is a little bit tricky to import into some things and we did come up with a solution to export it as a text file um, and we have had that work. So we have been able to export GoCAD into a variety of different um, software packages. I did want to pick on Geoscience Analyst a little bit and the reason why I wanted to choose this is because this is a, a free, freely available um, program to be able to visualise 3D models like this. Um, it's very easy to import all of those different GoCAD objects into Ge um, Geoscience Analyst, but I nonetheless did it and we have um, a Geoscience Analyst project that's sitting in that data pack as well. Um, last thing I wanted to mention is, as Cam's already talked about this already, but I'm gonna say it again, the model is freely available on GSV's online store. The report is coming, I promise, very soon. It's being formatted, but um, we're very close. So thanks very much for your time.